The locals had heard that their hero was in a tussle with the authorities and they had come to cheer him on. When the British saw the groundswell of support they realized that they were in a soup. Astonishingly it was Gandhi who bailed them out. He regulated and quietened the crowd before they decided to reduce the court to match wood. If they had made entry into the court, the British would have had to make a hasty exit. Gandhi showed them that Indians too had a mean side. The British wanted to buy time. Gandhi knew he had them on the back foot and wanted to press home his advantage. He demanded punishment for himself for his disobedience to the British law. He pontified grandly that he found himself in a conflict of duties, one towards the British rulers and the other towards humanitarian and national service. He chose to obey his conscience rather than the foreign lawful authority. He left everyone gaping with his holier-than-thou attitude. The magistrate announced a two-hour recess and asked Gandhi to furnish bail for those 120 minutes. Gandhi told him to get lost. The red-faced magistrate ultimately set Gandhi free and announced that he would declare his judgment after several days. When asked by Magistrate George Chander at Motihari District Court on 18th of April, to pay a security of 100 rupees, Gandhi humbly refused to be constrained by the diktat. Hundreds of thousands of people protested and rallied outside the court demanding his release, which the court unwillingly did. The case was subsequently withdrawn by the British government. Shrewdness. Gandhi knew that the British were in a hole and he was shrewd enough not to give them a chance to wriggle out. That is why he insisted on the completion of the case and, rejected the demand of his paying bail to escape jail. Not content to celebrate his great victory over the British, Gandhi collared a bunch of lawyers and put a hypothetical question. What would they have done if Gandhi had been carted to jail? The lawyers brazenly said they would have retired to their homes, because there would be no one to represent, if Gandhi was lodged in jail. How could they represent if the person to represent was not present but absent as he was present in prison? Gandhi realized that they were making a comedy out of him. Gandhi indignantly asked them about the fate of the peasants. The lawyers now muddled, went into a huddle. Gandhi was an outsider. Yet he was willing to go to jail for the sake of the peasants. The lawyers belonged to that region and they had claimed to represent the peasants. They had also extracted large fees. Now if they abandoned the peasants as well as their imprisoned champion, it would be a truly shameful desertion. Shamefacedly, they returned to Gandhi and vowed to give company if he went to jail. A pumped up Gandhi, announced to no one in particular that the Battle of Champaran was already won. Gandhi got a letter from the count and dispirited magistrate, that the lieutenant governor had ordered that, the case against Gandhi be closed quietly. To save face. Man molding. Even as he was busy with persuading the British rulers to head home, Gandhi was also analyzing his followers and tweaking out their weak points. Thus he molded them, so that they would be primed for the task of nation building, which lay ahead. Civil disobedience had triumphed for the first time in India. Now Gandhi and his assistants got down to data collection to build a strong case against the British landlords. Depositions on their grievances by 10,000 peasants were written down. Notes were made on other evidence. Documents were collected. The Indians were busy as bumblebees, while the alarmed landlords were bleeding their protests. The lieutenant governor, Sir Edward Gate, very late, wanted to know what the heck was going on. He summoned Gandhi who seemed to be the focus of all the happenings. Gandhi bid a nervous farewell to his friends and went to see Gate. Gate and Gandhi had four long meetings before Gate got the picture, being somewhat dimwitted. Gate set up an inquiry commission which had all the British like, the landlords, the officials, the missionaries, the gardeners, the laundrymen etc., against our one-man army.
When the big planters saw the mountain of evidence they had to climb, they admitted to their guilt and agreed to return the peasants' money. But how much? They thought that Gandhi would demand 100%. Gandhi asked for only 50%. There he was firm. Thinking he would refuse, the planters stretched out a measly 25%. They were caught flat-footed when Gandhi accepted. Later the Indians admonished Gandhi for being satisfied with just this token amount. Gandhi claimed that the money was not as important as the loss of prestige to the British. The planters who had been lording it over the peasants, like Lord Labak Das, now had to eat humble pie. His long-time suffering listeners had to be satisfied with his philosophy. Be that as it may be, Gandhi's ideas turned out to be true because the British found themselves with nobody to exploit and made tracks. Of course, the peasants were glad to see the back of them. Sharecropping disappeared and smiles returned to the faces of the poor peasants. After having smeared mud on the faces of the British, our busy buddy turned his focus on the social and cultural backwardness of the villages in Champaran. He appealed for help. Patriotic Indians appeared out of the woodwork, from various regions. Primary schools were opened in six villages. Astorba Gandhi busied herself by teaching the ashram rules on personal health and hygiene. Doctors were also coaxed to come and practice on the peasants. The three musketeers, castor oil, quinine and sulfur were the overworked, stock answer to all ailments. Gandhi saw the filthy clothes of the lady peasants and asked his wife to speak to them about it. The indignant ladies asked KG if there was any Nali silks in their villages. They possessed only one set of clothes. Finding the situation to be beyond her wits, KG made a hasty departure. Now Gandhi reminisced about his Champaran exploits. He had just reminded the British that he was the boss in his own country. Nation building. Gandhi was not content with political successes. His ultimate goal was a holistic life for each and every fellow Indian. He wanted an acceptable standard of social and cultural life for all. So, he was the most apt and ideal leader for the time. Gandhi taught a lesson in self-reliance. A Briton Charles Freer Andrews was supposed to go to the Fiji Islands to do some native bashing there. But for reasons best known to him, he wanted to be with Gandhiji instead. He was just waiting for Gandhi's okay. The Indians too favored to have the Briton with them. The white man would have bolstered their courage. But Gandhi picked out their chicken-heartedness. He sent Freer free in packing. He admonished the Indians for their phoning on Freer. He had read their minds correctly, one of them shamefully admitted. Thus Gandhiji proved that he was a boon and a gift from God to a long-suffering India. Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Self-reliance. Gandhi taught that self-reliance and self-confidence are the paths to man-making. To rely only on oneself is a lonely road but it ends in true liberation. Gandhi led organized protests and strike against the landlords, who with the guidance of the British government, signed an agreement granting more compensation and control over farming for the poor farmers of the region, and cancellation of revenue hikes and collection until the famine ended. It was during this agitation, that first time Gandhi was called Babu, father, by Sant Raud and Mahatma, great soul. Gandhi himself did not like being addressed as Mahatma, preferring to be called Babu. Summing up, Gandhiji was a truly great soul who not only rid us off the bloodsuckers but also set us on the path to the India of Tagore's dreams. No wonder, the great physicist, Albert Einstein called the Mahatma's assassination as the second crucifixion. Live as if you were to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were to live forever. The best way to find yourself, is to lose yourself in the service of others. You must be the change you wish to see in the word.
There are seven things that will destroy us. Wealth without work. Pleasure without conscience. Knowledge without character. Religion without sacrifice. Politics without principles. Science without humanity. Business without ethics. Nobody can hurt me without my permission. In a gentle way you can shake the world. Generations to come, it may well be, will scarce believe that such a man as this one ever in flesh and blood, walked upon this earth. There is an indefinable, mysterious power that pervades everything. I feel it, though I do not see it. It is this unseen power which makes itself felt, and yet defies all proof, because it is so unlike all that I perceive through my senses. It transcends the senses, but it is possible to reason out the existence of God to a limited extent. Even in ordinary affairs, we know that people do not know who rules or why and how he rules. And yet, they know that there is a power that certainly rules. In 1930, India was still the jewel in Britain's imperial crown. But a small man in a loincloth was proving to be a very rough diamond indeed. Mohandas Gandhi, rebel and holy man, was organizing the vast masses of India in an unprecedented resistance movement. There was no hint of it early on when after a privileged life in India, Gandhi had studied law in Victoria, London. Serving as a correspondent in the Boer War would help change his life. He gave up a wealthy law practice to work in South Africa for one pound a week, fighting discrimination against Asians. Here he developed the tactic of passive resistance that 20 years later he would exploit so brilliantly in India. For back in his homeland, he soon became a national figure of almost mythic authority.